as Nick says, this is about unexpected findings that we've had during this project. And we're going to begin with Rachel Nordlinger and Evan Kidd, who can't unfortunately be here, with a paper entitled, What the Eyes Reveal About Language, Sentence Production and Free Word Order Languages. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so this is a joint project uh, with uh, Evan Kidd, who, when my screen's moving around, uh, who we heard from this morning. Uh, and uh, looking at sentence planning and production in free word order languages in Australia. And I also want to acknowledge uh, our team, which includes uh, Gabby Garrido Rodriguez, who many of you will know, who is a code or postdoc, is now at Max Planck Institute in Nijmegen, and Sasha Wilmoth, who was speaking earlier today. And there's Evan again, just so you can see him. Um, so, many of you will know that psycholinguistic research has traditionally been based on a tiny proportion of the world's languages, and this means that we have a really urgent need to uh, help psycholinguistic theories confront the full array of typological diversity that field linguists have and continue to document. Um, and uh, to, to sort of partially address this, there's been recent research that has investigated the relationship between the word order of a language and uh, how this might affect sentence planning uh, by its speakers in, in language production. And I should say that much of this previous work that we're building on has come from Steve Levinson's team at the Max Planck Institute in Nijmegen. And this project is very much a codal baby, so we were inspired in, a, in one of the early meetings of CODAL, maybe 2015 or something. Steve was here in Canberra, gave a talk on all this fascinating research that he'd been involved in, and our project has sprung off from that. So it's, it's the unexpected in the sense that neither Evan nor I knew at the beginning of CODAL that this would be what we would be working on, but we're very, very pleased that we have been. So we uh, have extended this uh, research to Australian Indigenous languages that have very flexible word order. So the previous research had focused on languages with different types of word order, but not on languages with very flexible free word order. The sentence production um, is generally thought of as consisting of three broad stages. So before producing speech, speakers prepare a pre-verbal message in the conceptual formulation or event apprehension stage. Uh, this then gets coded uh, linguistically and then produced in speech or sign, articulated in some way. In this talk, we're just focusing particularly on the event apprehension stage, this very early planning stage. And in particular, the big question of whether the grammatical properties, in this case free word order, of the language being spoken affects the way in which speakers plan the sentence at this very early stage of production. So to address this, we use eye tracking and a picture description task. This is the methodology that had been used in the previous studies that I have already mentioned. Uh, and in, this, um, in these experiments, participants see a picture like this one on the screen and uh, the, the, the see the picture on the computer screen and they're asked to just describe what's happening in the picture. While they're doing this, there's an eye tracker that records their eye movements to different parts of the picture at different times of the process. When people describe simple scenes like this, the shifts in their gaze between the different elements on the picture are a sensitive index of how they're approaching the, the planning, which parts of the message are being encoded and how they get combined. So we can look at the timing of fixations to different participants in the picture, and that can tell us quite a lot about how speakers are planning their sentence. In these previous studies that I mentioned, um, speaking very broadly, because I only have 15 minutes, what they tended to find is that there was a relationship between the word order of the language and the way in which speakers uh, planned the sentence, or, or where they looked in this um, event apprehension stage. So SVO languages, like Dutch and English, so languages that are subject first, we find speakers tend to fixate mostly on the agent in this very early stage. Uh, whereas verb initial sentences, like Tseltal or Tagalog, we see much more even looks across agent and patient, 
at this real, very early stage. And that, that sort of makes sense because if you're trying to get the verb out, you're going to need to know something about the whole event, whereas if you're trying to get the, set, the subject out first, you can focus on the agent. So we asked, well, what happens if the language has free word order? What happens then? So to address this, we've uh, looked so far at two languages in Australia, Murimpapa and Pindara, and they're both languages that have, are known to have quite flexible word order properties. Uh, but crucially, they're very different in other respects. So Murimpapa is a non pamanyungan language, head marking, polysynthetic, very complex verbs with lots of information packed into them. Uh, Pindara is a Pamanyungan language from Central Australia and it's dependent marking language. So not very complex verbs in, in that same way, but complex case marking system. We um, conducted the experiment in the field. So we took the eye tracking equipment out to the field. We think this is the first time this has happened in Australia. And uh, we worked with 43 speakers of Mudumpapa and 49 speakers of Pindara. And uh, speakers were given some pictures on a computer screen. There's an eye tracker that sits just under the computer screen that recorded, tracked their eye movements as they were describing what was happening in the picture. Each participant was shown 141 pictures. Uh, so this consisted of 48 transitive events, which were the ones we were interested in. By transitive event, we mean pictures that show some, someone or something doing something to someone or something else, right? So two participants, uh, one that's an agent, one that's a patient. Uh, and these were, uh, there were also 93 fillers that were mostly intransitive events. Um, the test pictures were fully crossed for participant role and humanness, so there were both human and non-human agents, human and non-human patients of equal numbers across the 48 pictures. And we also controlled for left and right, so the images were flipped in 50% of the trials. Participants were asked to describe the picture, their eye movements were recorded, their responses were transcribed in alarm and um, checked or done in conjunction with native speakers. So firstly, we found great variability in the word orders produced. This was good, this supported our hunch that these were languages that allowed very flexible word order. So there's 10 different word orders in the Murupapa data, 11 in the Pingata data. And even though there are differences between the two, so um, Murupapa, the, the most common word order in Murupapa was uh, AVP, still less than 50% of responses, whereas in Pindara, it was APB. So now I'm using A for agent, P for patient. But overall, there was quite a lot of variability in both languages. And it's interesting to compare this to a study that Salpa did in 2017 on German, which is also claimed, well, I'm not claimed, but does have some flexible word order. Um, where, when Sebastian conducted a similar study on German, he actually only got three word orders in his set of responses, and one of them was used 75% of the time. So the sort of flexibility we're seeing here is quite different from the sort of flexibility that we see in languages like German. Um, uh, so this is just an example showing you some of the different responses for one picture. It was interesting for us to note that participants produced on average five different word orders across the experiment for each participant. So not even, I mean, even individuals are showing an array of word order across the experiment, all right? If you speak a free word order language, you don't have to do that, perhaps. You know, before we did this, we thought, well, maybe people just pick an order and just do it for all the answers, but they didn't do that. Okay, so what did we find? Now I've got to whiz you through eye tracking in three and a half seconds. Um, so, here we have the Murimpata uh, agent verb patient results. And what I want you to focus on here is just that very first stage, that's the first 600 milliseconds, this is the event apprehension stage. So this is 600 milliseconds after the picture comes up on the screen. So it's a very, very short period of time. And the red line is the proportion of looks to the agent, and the blue line is the proportion of looks to the patient. And what you can see here for the Murupaka results is that there's quite an even distribution of looks in this 
time through this first event application stage across agent and patient. This is what's called relational encoding, where the speakers are looking across both participants in this very early planning stage. And this is very different to the results in other languages, as you can see on the slide. So in Dutch, for example, uh, here the agent is the black line, the patient is the red line. Sorry, it switches it around. But what you can see here in Dutch is that in this early event apprehension stage, the speakers are looking predominantly at the agent. And it's not until much later in the process that they switch to looking at patient. Even in Santa, which is a verb initial language, um, but does have uh, an A, B, P word order option in certain situations, we still find the same sort of result where speakers look primarily to the agent in event apprehension. And that's very, very different to the Murupatta. So you might think, well, you know, that's just because Murupatta is a head marking language. It's a polysynthetic language, it's got a very complex verb. Speakers have to get the verb out, so of course it's natural that very early on they're going to have to look very quickly across the whole event because they've got to deal with this big verb. But in fact, when we look at the Pindala data, we find exactly the same thing. So on the left here, you've got two H initial orders in Muripata, and on the right, you've got the same two orders in Pindala. And if you look again in the event apprehension stage in yellow, orange, you can see there's relational encoding in both languages in a very similar way. Uh, across all the word orders. So it doesn't seem to be about head marking in Murupatta and what we um, believe is that it's about the flexibility of word order. So you can see that fixations are distributed across the two characters, evidence of relational encoding, I've said that, and crucially this happens, this relational encoding happens at a much earlier stage of speech planning than has been found in fixed word, word order languages in previous studies. If we look at patient initial sentences, again, they look a bit different, but again, in this event apprehension stage, we find relational encoding in all cases. There are greater looks to the patient than we saw in the agent uh, studies, uh, results, uh, but relational encoding in all cases in, in both languages. And the greater looks to patient actually show a sort of early signature of the word order, the patient initial word order that the speaker ultimately produces. So what this shows us is that in this first 600 milliseconds, speakers are not only looking across the whole event, but already making a decision about the word order they're going to choose and already starting to change their um, looks in accordance to that word order choice. And you can see this very clearly uh, if you look at this is now just looking at Murupatta. This is four different word orders in Murupatta. And what you can see here is the patterns for each word order are different. Every word order is different. In the event apprehension stage, this first little bit, we have relational encoding in all cases, but different patterns of looking. So this is really, really striking that in 600 milliseconds, people are looking across the event and choosing a word order and starting to change their planning based on the word order that they've chosen. So, um, in conclusion, Murupatta and Pindala are, are typologically very different languages, but they both have this flexible word order and they show striking similarities in how they process information in event apprehension. Uh, they engage in rapid relational encoding, which is very different to what is found in previous research on other languages with more fixed word orders. And we think this suggests that speaking a free word order language significantly influences sentence planning strategies. So perhaps the pressure to settle on a word order may push relational encoding much earlier in the planning process than in languages with more fixed word orders. And this makes exciting and important contributions, we think, to our understanding of sentence planning and production cross-linguistically. You don't get to hear about the next steps. Thank you very much. <laughs>
Thank you, Kate. <laughs> Here's a slide I prepared earlier. Um, so the next steps are, we were fortunate to, re to receive an ARC discovery project to continue this work. We're bringing on board Ina Monkesel Szlazewski and Matthias Szlazewski from the University of South Australia. We're going to extend the production experiment to a third language, Walbury, which is the sort of classic free word or language in the literature. Um, but we also want to um, supplement this with comprehension experiments, uh, looking at the way free word order works in the, in the, the sort of comprehension side of things as well as production. Well, Thank you. Last uh, quickly to follow up on that, I just wondered if you'd, uh, if you're thinking of doing similar things with bilingual speakers uh, speaking in English, who are, you know, native speakers of rural Yeah, it's, um, look, we've thought about it a lot, we get asked this question a lot. Um, it would be great. I think it's difficult, it's difficult to know, it's difficult to control for exact bilingualism and exact um, equivalences, you know, to find 50 people who are exactly equally bilingual in the two languages so that you know any differences you find are really due to the language rather than other factors um, it makes it a bit tricky. So we haven't worked out how to do that yet, but it would be great to see how that works. Thank you. Rachel. Thank you. Our next talk is by Martin Hip, and the title of this is Same Cues, Different Processing, The Case of Prosody. Thanks a lot. Um, hi everyone. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about some of the experiments I did, uh, funded by Kodo, looking at the role of prosody in speaking. Very importantly, I'd like to recognize the research legacy of my late advisor, Anne Cutler. Uh, Anne had been a very important figure in my research life, uh, both intellectually and personally. Um, and on a more personal note, uh, Anne had also been a very wonderful life coach um, to me. Uh, so uh, even though sometimes she didn't want to be one. <laughs> so yeah, so the research that I'm going to present today would not be possible without her incredible past research contributions and also without her guidance and care to be as a student. Of course, I'd like to thank Kurdo uh, for the very generous funding I received when I was a student with Kurdo um, at the Marx Institute since 2015. Um, and I also want to recognize uh, my current affiliation, the University of Pennsylvania, um, for letting me pursue my own research interest and continue to fund this line of research. So the question that we were very interested in is what are the universal and language-specific processing features of speaking and listening? Our approach to this question is threefold. First, we, we adopt a cross-linguistic standpoint where we want to compare speakers across typologically distinct languages to pinpoint the similarities and processing diversity. We also conduct experiments where we manipulate certain variables to find cause and effect relations. And more recently, we explore the developmental origins of different processing effects by looking at young children and infants. So in the domain of prosody, are there universals in language processing? Um, we now know that prosody is one of the most language-specific dimensions of speech, but more than four decades ago, people like Dwight Bollinger have argued that there are at least two universal functions in prosody. First, he argues we use uh, prosody to mark focus, to encode information structure. And secondly, he argued that we use it to mark junctures uh, or se sentence boundaries, the boundaries in sentence formation. Uh, in this talk, we like to argue that sometimes, even when we do see the same cues and structures across languages, there can still be language-specific differences in how they are processed by the human mind. But first, let me provide you with an unexpected uh, uh, some, some unexpected findings where different cues are processed in the same way uh, across different speakers of like, different languages. And this is a case of prosodic focus. So for focus, we now know based on years of language documentation research that how prosody is used to mark focus, and even whether prosody is used to mark focus, varies widely across languages. 
but we still don't know whether there are some uh, language similar or universal mechanisms uh, for processing parsley in listing. Um, and this is due to the lack of direct cross-linguistic cross experiment. So one way to look at this is to do a phoneme detection task where we could ask speakers to entrain to parsley of different languages and see what kinds of processing consequences this may have. So back in the 70s, um, Anne did this phoneme detection task on speakers of Germanic languages where she asked listeners to uh, listen to some sentences. Uh, some of these sentences had, um, a, fo had a prosodic focus predicted on the word book, um, so with something like the couple had poured over a book they had read, where the preceding intonation contour leads you to a prediction on the word book. And in other sentences, uh, the word book was unfocused, and the preceding intonation contour does not lead you to a focus on book. Um, interestingly, Anne also uh, replaced those acoustically salient word book and unfocused word books with um, acoustically neutral versions of the same words. And what, we and what they found is that uh, even after removing the acoustically salient or unfocused versions of the word book, uh, people still press the button in response to book faster. Um, in sentences where the preceding intonation contour leads you to a prediction on the word book. So we were interested in seeing whether these processing effects also generalize across languages with very different phonological systems, particularly languages like Mandarin, where you have lexical tones and the expression of uh, supersegmental properties on these prosodic contours for focus prediction may be constrained by the use of the same kinds of cues uh, for lexical identity. So we had both English and Mandarin speakers listen to sentences in their native language, uh, did the phoneme detection task, and had to press a button as soon as they heard a word starting with P, which exists in both languages. And consistent with what we thought, uh, both English and Mandarin uh, had very different uh, prosodic cues in their intonation contours. So English had a range of cues that help them predict where focus will be in the sentence. Something like expanded pitch range and greater intensity and duration. Whereas in Mandarin, uh, speakers only produce F0 range expansion. But nonetheless, despite these different cues in the prosodic contours, both English and Mandarin speakers entrain to the speech stream to exactly the same extent. So we see here that um, uh, English speakers showed faster response times in a small number uh, in the dark blue bar uh, when the target sound is predicted to have high stress compared to when the target sound is predicted to have low stress. And the effect was exactly the same in Mandarin. So this um, may argue that there is some kind of universals in this thing, um, in how people entrain to uh, the prosodic contours in the immediate speech stream, um, despite the differences in the cues. We also found within a language variety, uh, within in Australian English spoken in Sydney, speakers also differ in the extent to which they use different kinds of cues. So some speakers use uh, all kinds of cues, other speakers only produce pre-focused pause. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we found that listeners could all engage across the board um, in this prosodic entrainment strategy to predict where in a sentence a focus will be. Um, so this effect also generalized across different speaker-specific contexts. Uh, more recently at Penn, uh, with collaborators like John Truswell in psychology, uh, and also Alex de Cavallo at uh, Paris University, we also found that younger children could use prosodic focus to learn the meanings of words. So we did an eye-tracking experiment. Uh, this was done during the pandemic, so everything was done like a, in an internet webcam-based experiment. Uh, so we, in this eye-tracking experiment, we varied the um, familiarity or the degree of novelness of different people and different actions. So here uh, in the middle you see um, uh, children were familiarized with this particular girl doing this particular action. And at test, 
they saw the same girl, this time doing a completely new action, or a completely novel person, this time doing a familiar action. And what we found was that children as young as three-year-olds could look longer at a new person when a name is prosodically focused, and they look longer at the new action when a verb is prosodically focused. So this shows that um, at very young age, uh, inconsistent with previous findings from the 70s, um, arguing that uh, young children do not understand the use of prosodic focus, we found that children, through a more implicit recognition task, could use prosodic focus as a means um, to contrast different visual reference, and they could use it to understand the meanings of different verbs and nouns. So now I want to move on to the second case study, which is on the processing of prosodic junctions. So we know there are still some subtle differences across languages in how junctions are produced, um, but overall, um, we argue that there are overall cross-language similarities. So we see across languages uh, similarities in how pre-boundary lengthening is produced. Uh, there are pauses to mark the junctures. We also see uh, domain initial consonantal strengthening for all kinds of segments and also for many languages. But, this, but due to the lack of direct cross-language experiments, we don't know whether similarities in production uh, are also reflected in similarities in listening. So, and, and the reason for this could be due to um, different sentence types across languages that made it very difficult to compare across languages. And um, obviously, junctures are influenced by these different syntactic constituents. So, we found a solution to this, and the solution is one particular type of sentence in both English and Mandarin that allows exactly the same kinds of syntactic ambiguity that could be um, disambiguated using exactly the same kinds of prosodic cues. So I want you to consider this sentence. Uh, David gave her rat poison to eat. Um, this sentence is syntactically ambiguous um, because um, if you mark a juncture after her, the early juncture, uh, her could be the indirect object, the recipient of the poison, uh, and rat poison is the compound noun. Um, but when you mark a juncture after rat, the late juncture context, um, her is now the possessive. Um, and both English and Mandarin allows exactly the same kinds of syntactic ambiguity. Another kind of sentence example is, uh, he saw her duck under the chair. Um, in Mandarin, it's he saw, sorry, he saw her duck under the chair, or he saw her duck under the chair. Uh, in Mandarin, we have the same kind of example. He saw her hide under the chair. He saw, he saw her cat under the chair, or he saw her hide under the chair. So we have about 22 of those sentences, um, and we compare across both English and Mandarin listeners. So do English and Mandarin listeners differ in how they process prosodic junctures to um, disambiguate exactly the same kind of syntactic ambiguity using the same kinds of prosodic cues that are available in both languages. So we also had a um, psycholinguistic task where we also again had button pressing, um, participants saw on their screen uh, two interpretation sentences um, corresponding to the two buttons. They heard the sentence and they had to press the button as soon as they understood what the sentence means. So it's a reaction type task, but they are also tested on their accuracy. So do identical structures and identical prosodic features equal identical listening? What we found is a resounding no. Um, for English speakers, um, participants uh, disambiguated sentences with late junctures, like you saw her rat poison, uh, faster compared to sentences where um, her is the indirect object. Uh, on the other hand, Mandarin, in Mandarin, it was the exact opposite. We also found the same trend uh, in sentences um, where we took out the pause and leave other kinds of uh, juncture cues intact, like pre-boundary lengthening. And so we argue that Mandarin and English listeners patterned very differently. We also asked whether those Mandarin speakers 
who were learning English as a second language, uh, do they show the same kinds of strategy as their native language, or do they adopt the strategy of um, their second language? No, again, these, in, these sentences were exactly the same in terms of syntactic ambiguity across both languages, using the same cues. But nonetheless, we found uh, that they did not generalize either strategy. Uh, so, in summary, uh, for prosodic focus, we argue that there can be different cues across languages, but processing um, in certain contexts, like prosodic entrainment, may be the same. Uh, and for juncture, we see similarities in production that do not lead to similarities in this strategy. Thanks so much. Oh, this is a joke from Anne. Uh, so he saw her duck under the chair, and um, in Mandarin, it's also the same. He saw her cat under the chair, or saw her hide under the chair. So. <laughs> This is a little bit of a joke from Anne, um, perhaps. <laughs>
first of all, when I talk, first of all, when I talk state gender, of course I talk about romance and gender. And as Corbett um, says, if he puts it no longer a marking on the noun can prove that the language has a gender system. The evidence that nouns have gender values in the given language lies in the agreement target which shows gender. So it's not about a distinction as noun marking as as the masculine and feminine. And this is especially up for Yemek because the verb is the only agreement target of the gender. I'm just going to see if I can go back one to go to the yes. Um, because you're all yes. very and um, because you're all very highly trained linguists, you've completely analyzed this example of you already and you have noticed that the verb that the verb for person is the same in both sentences. So the actual the entire object phrase on the is person. So this small person is the same in both sentences. So the only way to interpret one sentence as you see the small man versus to see the small woman is the verb. Okay. 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 So just a quick Okay. okay. So just a quick detour of house gender. Fine. That's not particularly unusual. Yemek has a um, two gender system. It aligns when it comes to humans. It aligns with biological sex. That's why I keep using the labels masculine and feminine. For animals. Um, if for animals. If the biological sex is physical or relevant, we don't put domesticated animals, for instance. Um, it also aligns with biological sex. Otherwise, it's often masculine, except for like certain groups, which tends to be feminine, like birds or insects. But there are also always counter examples, so it's not the, the gender assignment is still not transparent. And it also assigns gender to inanimate objects. And for instance, for celestial bodies, we have a story in fashion gender when it comes from that. And if, but for um, plants, for instance, but for plants, for instance can go either way. I suspect it has something to do with okay. shape and size, because it happens in other languages in New Guinea. But again, it's not transparent. So yeah, this is like in other uh, languages that have gender. It's pretty much true. So come to the so come to the very interesting part is more the expression of gender. And so the, first um, thing to note is, so the first thing to note is, I said that the only agreement target for, um, for object gender is, um, for object gender but is the verb, but, but there are other agreement targets for other categories, to see that in the context. So as you can see in the sentence, um, the, the marker on small is actually, that's a singular marker, so you, it, it marks the number, um, and it also in I don't know if oh, you can see that number the in um, subject, number and personal subject is marked right. in the affixes, but the, um, the, gender of, the gender of the object really is only um, encoded in the verb step. Okay. So yes, I'm calling okay. this okay. So yes, I'm calling this completion because I call it into sources like Mitchell 1994. Two linguistic signs are in a relationship of suppletion if the semantic difference between them is maximally regular, so like a distinction between feminine and masculine gender is very regular. Distinction while their formal difference is maximally irregular. So you can't be predicted by system or alternation. On top of this, the suppletion is often treated as a gradient phenomenon. So you have weak suppletion on one side, where you have it's fully regular, but actually the difference is all very small, all the way to strong suppletion, where it's fully regular, but the difference is also the modern phonological difference is also very bad. And Yannick has a whole spectrum. So it has verbs that only differ in small ways and verbs that differ in very substantial ways. And it's, but in, it's, in every instance, it's not possible to predict from one form what the other form would be, or even if there is not only one form, because 
Not all verbs. There's, um, I have, there's, um, I have, there's, um, the paradigms get very complex. So probably about 120 verbs for reliable paradigms for, and 70 of those don't do any. That includes a lot of change. That includes intransitives, which wouldn't happen naturally. But it also includes a lot of transitive verbs, which do take objects, but they still use the same stem throughout. So they just don't mark the object gender at all. So they don't do an alternative. Right, they just don't have their marking. So, so, just to show you some examples, this is on the stronger suppletion and the spectrum. So, you have works like these, which have substantially different stems for the, um, the feminine singular objects and masculine singular objects. And um, so, gender the gender suppletion only happens in the singular, that's why it's marked here. So what happens in the plural? Well, for most verbs, they, they don't mark the gender difference, they just use the feminine set again. But, because, you know, why you don't want to make it any more complex, um, Yannick also has verbal suppletion for number. So there are verbs which end up having three stems, one for feminine singular objects, one for masculine singular objects, and one for plural objects. And just to completely confuse you, I'll show you what this looks like in full paradigm. Because obviously, Yannick also indexes the subject. So you have four tenses, distant past, recent past, present and future tense. And then there's downwards on the table, there's the subject marking, so there's um, three person values and two number values and subject gender on top of this. And, and then in red, the crosses with the object marking, so the, um, this is foot. Yeah. So there's a feminine singular stance for foot. This is when you have a masculine singular object, and this is when you have a plural object. And I think I talked very fast, so you might actually have time for questions. So, answering those might take a while. Specialised and sort of drawn into the ambit of the Gover. So 
Presumably, it was something like that with pairs of verbs that had some similar meaning but were stereotypically associated with different gendered objects. And there should still be cognates of at least some of those verbs among the five languages of the family. I don't know, that's just a suggestion. That would be a great follow-up project, obviously. When, so like I said, when I looked at my class, well, so it's, when I started the project, looked at both, but then I kind of specialized on Yemek, so I haven't really, with what I know about Yemek, haven't really gone back to look in detail, apart from trying to get as many word lists from as many varieties as I could to just for the picture. So, but that would be a very interesting question. But then again, I mean, Yes, go on, went is a, is a nice example, but like even Yemek, the words that have, so it's 43 verbs that have that kind of pattern, which is not, so I have actually had, had another slide just if somebody asks a question. Um, there's, there's, there's some groups I've, uh, I would try to, as best as I could, to group a bit. So there's some verbs, you know, that have this pattern that they have in the feminine stem, they have O's, and then they have E. In, this, uh, in the masculine stem. So there's a couple of things you kind of tend to tantalizing. There might be a pattern, but there's only like kind of like five verbs that do it that way. And then you have two verbs that do it the other way around. And so so you, that's why I can't say this is like a real pattern. So there's probably like weaker kind of types of solution. There's some things that look at this, there might be something, but you don't know, really. And then there's things, always counter examples, and there's things that don't seem to fall in any kind of pattern. But yeah, um, yeah, it'd be nice to know. Yeah. <laughs> also, it'd be great to if somebody would work on like any of those other like, like languages I've, where I've seen in the sketches, like Tor languages, for instance, North of New Guinea, or like school on the other side in the north, seem to have something like that, maybe. So it's, just, it's just not enough data to really tell at the moment. That's beautiful. We'll leave it there, Tina. Yeah. You can go off and get some more data. <laughs>
and very different behaviors, right? We're not homogeneous just because we speak the same language or sign the same language. And so people are a really important component to language behavior, and it's a little bit missing uh, in typology. So let's get them back in there. We use the family problems picture task, uh, which is a series of 16 cards that look like uh, somewhat like the one you see here. Some of them are a little bit more dicey in nature than that one. Uh, people look at these cards, they describe them with a partner, they order them, and then someone else comes in and they tell the story to that new person, either in third person or first person. And what we get there is a restrained sample of things that people are talking about, but people can still talk about whatever they want. So it is uh, messier than uh, an experiment, but it is also more narrow in scope than uh, talking about whatever you want. And we put together the data for this, um, all of the things that we collected across these languages, to our scopic corpus, social cognition parallax interview corpus, and uh, this is someone doing the task in Papua New Guinea. And there are a lot of us in this project. Some of these are uh, familiar faces or even your own faces uh, uh, up here. Uh, and so we have quite a few people that are working on this project by now, quite a few languages throughout the world, although we certainly de definitely have a Pacific uh, focus. Our domains of interest that we've been coding for this corpus for a while now uh, include a lot of different things that we think are important for people to be able to connect with others or, and things that uh, are reflections of people's connections in language. Today I'm going to talk to you about two aspects of reported speech, thought, and emotions, or reported utterance more generally. And this is from a paper that came out earlier this year um, with many of our scoping authors. So we're going to take a look at two variables that are part of the reported utterance domain, and one of them is a structural variable. Basically, uh, do people and do languages tend to use more direct or indirect framing for reported speech? Let's have a look at what that is. So we've got one example from Mato Carpanao, which is the language that I work on, and what we have here is um, someone's worrying. And so we're describing the person who's worried, and then we shift into the viewpoint of that person, we shift in tense, we shift in grammatical person, um, we shift in the polar, the like the sentence type, uh, and so that when you're reporting someone else's uh, speech or language use, you're shifting into what they are doing or what you are at least imagining or purporting that they're doing. Compare that with Abatime below, where we've got. Uh, I'm going to read the English translation rather than Abatime, and the woman's talking about how the man hit her. And so we have um, still her uh, in there, and so we're not getting that shift, right? So that's direct versus indirect speech. Uh, and this, it's much bigger up there for you guys. So here is a table, and don't worry about too much of all the differences. What I want you to look for are gray bars that go all the way across the graph. So if you look at Auslan, which is that top row, you see that um, the top row is reflecting the language mean, so overall 93% of the utterances that we collected, you, maybe the numbers are wrong, it's very tiny here, uh, mm -hmm. are direct and very few are indirect. The minimum and the maximum for each of these is very similar across speakers, right? So that within Auslan, signers, sorry, uh, all of the Auslan signers do something quite similar to each other. They're a homogeneous group within the language. Uh, but if you pop down to Balinese, uh, what you see is that there are some people who do only direct speech and some people who do only indirect speech. And so that speaking Balinese uh, doesn't seem to guide you into one path or another. They're a very heterogeneous group. Some groups are more homogeneous and some more heterogeneous, and it doesn't have to do with how many speakers there are in the group. Um, that's just, uh, it kind of falls out like that. So what we do is we do some um, modeling where we take into account, we do three different model comparisons, statistical models, where we say, okay, let's compare each of these languages. We also compare a few other things, like the genre that people are doing. Uh, for this one, we also looked at whether they see a thought bubble or a speech bubble um, when they're looking at the card, um, which we think might kind of help um, influence the content of it, and 
we say, okay, if you're just looking at languages only, which is the first set of model results there, in the first three columns, there are significant differences between many of those languages. Or if you go to the other side, um, the third set of model results, you see that, um, well, let's not do that one. The middle column is showing that if you're taking into account a random effect of speakers and signers, of uh, language users, and, the, uh, and you're taking the languages as the fixed effects in the model, that um, the model performs better. That's the uh, Akake information criterion score that's highlighted at the very top. Um, and you also see, I think this is the important part, so that Balinese, for instance, is gray on the first model set of results, saying like, oh, it's significantly different than our reference level, but once you take into the diversity of the people that speak Balinese, it isn't significant. And so uh, there's a few important things here from this methodologically, is that first of all, we totally can take people into account when we do typology, right? The methods already exist to do this. Uh, second of all, that if you don't take into account individual variation, you're going to uh, presume that there are some variations that are coming from languages rather than from people. Um, but we, the other important thing to take away uh, from it is that even when you take into account individual people, there's still plenty of languages that do show a distinct pattern. All right, so we do see Murumbata, Matukakuna, Dalabon, Japanese, and Auslan that are all significantly different from the reference level. So they maintain that whether or not you're taking into account the variance from each individual person. I press the tape over button, this one. All right, so now we're gonna move to another uh, domain here. Same kind of uh, sentences that we're looking at. When you talk about what people are doing to use a speech verb or a thought verb, um, or, and speech might be other kinds of things, but we talk about like inner world versus outer wor world. So signing, we would consider one of like an outer world kind of perspective. So what we've got here um, is a cognitive predicate from Russian. He thinks, oh, I knew it. It was actually an unauthorized rally. Or in Taliban, um, the woman used to say to me, why are you drinking grog? And so the idea is that you are either the People who are doing this task are conceptualizing things either as things that's private to the person that is doing them, and they're saying, you, we really don't have access to what this is, or they're presenting it as this is what's happening in the outer world that everyone would have access to. So these are the kind of dimensions that we're looking at, the semantic dimension, that also lets us know about how people are letting others into the world in their narratives. Um, we also included this time things that weren't framing uh, reported utterances, so this is from Kogi, uh, he's just thinking, blah, 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 and then another one is about, they're arguing with each other. So when you say someone's thinking, I mean, I guess we're all thinking all the time, but you don't really know, right? Uh, but whereas arguing is visible to the outer world. All right, and so remember these gray bars that you looked at, they were going across, and in the other graph, there's a whole bunch of these gray bars, and here, there's very few. So what that means is that the structural uh, property is something that's very constrained by the language, whereas the semantics is not so constrained, that people are really just doing whatever they want when they're choosing the contentful aspect of uh, the verb. Uh, we do get some significant differences um, between languages, uh, even if we're taking into account individual variation. So we're seeing Dalawan, Balinese, and Russian are all significantly different from the intercept level, from the reference level. Um, but if we weren't taking into account that individual variation, then there would be uh, some languages that we would classify as significantly different that aren't like uh, Sanzi Dargua or Mantukar. So what that tells us is that we see a lot more heterogeneous behavior in the semantic domain than in the structural domain, as you might expect but that the language still matters for the semantic choices as well. And we can also kind of, because we're interested in the language differences, this is just to show you how different the languages are from each other. Uh, but I'll just end this with some takeaways that um, in the, this paper that we uh, published, we looked at uh, two more case studies. Um, and in these, the semantic variables show robust language delineation for some languages. Semantic variables show more difference from individuals. But in each case, taking into account both languages and individuals is best. 
Uh, and having the most language internal variation in our study is not always due to just having more people included. Uh, and the corpus is a great way to find out about people's linguistic choices and compare them typologically. Giving, uh, having more data points gives us a richer picture of people's behavior. And I think this all speaks to some of the things that we've seen throughout this uh, CODAL end of center event that um, people really matter and that we, uh, I think, have done a really good job in the last uh, eight and a bit years to s put the focus on languages that before maybe people would go in for a few months, document them, and then you're done. If we spend more time with these languages and more time on our research, we're getting such a richer picture of what's going on. I think people and humans are always going to be part of that, and I think uh, that's something that I'm quite proud of. Thanks. Our next talk is from Janet Fletcher, and it's entitled Sounding Out the Pacific, Another Look at Phonetics, the Phonetics and Phonology of French Polynesian Languages. Right, um, so really, uh, I just, the work I'm going to talk about today uh, has come about um, from a sort of a desire, I think, right from the beginning of the uh, centre to actually sort of start exploring some aspects of the phonetics and phonology of languages in Oceania. But originally, it was going to be thinking about Vanuatu, and we've been able to do some work, thanks largely to Rosie Billington and uh, Nick Tierberger. It's been a fantastic um, collaboration, but also with Hal Stokes and Coralie Cram. Uh, but the big surprise was I ended up going to Tahiti, which uh, came very much out of the, um, the event uh, that we were talking about yesterday, which then fed into a, a field trip uh, that, that enabled me to do some, uh, some work that I'm going to talk about today. And also, we've also been exploring some work uh, in New Caledonia, uh, largely led by Kathleen Adonis. So, why explore the phonetics and phonology of French Polynesian languages? And in fact, um, a linguist who shall remain nameless said to me, but Janet, they have no phonology. They're so easy. <laughs> and this is true. This is a very common perception that they're regarded as having very simple phonology with seven to ten consonants, five vowel contrasts, usually with the length also, if you think about Australian English, 16 contrasted consonants, 22 vowels, depending on your analysis. Uh, French Polynesian languages have no consonant clusters, um, and then um, according to Charpentier and Francois, they show severe phonetic erosion. Well, that's kind of got my hackles. I think as a phonetician, let's go and really explore what's going on here. Uh, prosody, to a certain extent, has largely been ignored, apart from word level uh, descriptions, uh, and it was pretty well understudied across the various languages, uh, but often regarded to be simple and straightforward. So hopefully you might actually get to hear some of these. And we're going to be starting down the left-hand corner with Muruku, uh, then moving up to uh, Marquisan, and the Iroena variety, and then on to Tahitian. So. Iturago itir aitit aititit anu amai. My apologies, that's the Eo Himana, the northern variety. So you can probably imagine one of the sound categories we're going to be looking at <laughs> quite closely from that, that sound clip. But just a brief foray into prosody, because I think every talk I've given in <laughs> many years of casual always mentioned prosody. Uh, and we, we uh, certainly have limited coverage, particularly when it starts looking at post-lexical prosody. But of course, there have been marvelous work that's come out of, of various uh, grammatical descriptions and overviews by many colleagues. Uh, also, uh, many people coming from this, in this wonderful institution itself. Uh, and there has been, in general, a sort of a growth and interest in looking at prosody in oceanic languages in general. Um, as I said though, French Polynesian languages assume to have word stress or accent, but beyond that, there's, there's been sort of relatively little work. So, discovery one, well not really a discovery, more a confirmation, 
because uh, essentially what we were factoring in in the work that I'm presenting here was thinking about the way that word stress might interact with things like vowel length, but also position in an utterance, for example, so thinking about the relationship between phrasal stress and um, word level stress. Uh, typically described as uh, accent de longueur, meaning length, so a length accent or an intensity accent, uh, and long vowels tend to pretty religiously attract stress, some diphthongs also, but otherwise just accent of not to its syllable. So that's sort of the, the basic description that has been given here. So let's have a look at the interaction with long vowels. Oh, it's not. Okay, so just go back. So essentially, what we've got is, is a speaker producing maleni, maleni, and then malo. So very much we did find that in our work that and I'm sorry I don't know how to play the files. So maleni. Oh. <laughs> much nicer to hear our actual speakers producing this. Uh, and in this experiment, we also recorded EGG activity. So this is a, a technique uh, where you basically strap on uh, two electrodes either side of the throat, trying to capture the level of impedance across the vocal folds. So it just enables you to really kind of focus in on, on what is actually going on. In the glottis and the larynx, which uh, has, is, I have to say, is having a moment in phonetics and speech science. <laughs> People are really seriously getting into what's going on. Uh, with the larynx again, which is great to see. So thinking about just some standard acoustic plots here, so uh, what we've got here is we're looking at the pitch trace, so the fundamental frequency, so the melody of voice. The red signal to make it easy is the stressed syllable. The blue is the unstressed. Uh, and we can see that we've got nice curves. Okay, so, and this is the long vowels, I'm just sort of uh, showing you the long vowels in the left plot here that we do get a very, very nice um, in the uh, accented syllables versus the unaccented uh, syllables, which of course included only short vowels, because it seemed to be very much the case that, that there was this kind of attraction, stress attraction to long vowels, so very, very consistent. Uh, but interestingly, when you turn your attention to the other main parameter that people often talk about and duration, it was really largely carried by the long vowels. So the height of the little boxes in the left indicate how long a syllable was uh, relative to, uh, and red meaning stressed, blue unstressed, and we see that it was really in the top plots, it was the long vowels that seemed to be um, carrying the day. When we looked at the short vowels, we started to see, and I guess this was a not, not exactly unexpected, but it certainly kind of seemed to be the case that when you have words with only short vowels, that was, there was quite a lot of variation across the corpus. So uh, we had some speakers producing a more French-like pattern, because remembering the, the context that we're in and the, you know, the fact that we, we were really dealing with very, very, very bilingual speakers here, uh, others produced a more uh, 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 Expected pattern, i.e., standard penultimate. So hopefully this will play. No, no. Back again. Never mind. So it sounds like there's something like potto. So you had some speakers talk, producing potto as opposed to potto. Okay, so the usual kind of word that if you've ever done work on Australian uh, Indigenous language stress, you <laughs> listen again, wasn't that? Anyway, so, but quite clearly in this case. Okay. Skipping over, just in the interest of time. Now thinking about just general timing variation. Uh, and it's been claimed previously that all of the uh, French Polynesian languages have very similar timing patterns and perceived rhythm. Okay. All have simple CV syllable structures, long and short vowels consistently across the, uh, the, the languages. Uh, and, but interestingly, within the Marquesan varieties, the northern variety versus the uh, southern variety, there's been a huge stoush over how to represent long vowels in the orthography. Uh, and there are two camps. One camp that say, yes, there are long vowels and we will preserve our marron no matter what. The other camp say, no, you know, really, the long vowels are only emerging through some sort of consonant loss and some sort of remission process. So you've just sort of ended up with uh, uh, long vowels. But anyway, that was just a kind of an interesting uh, take uh, from uh, that emerged uh, working uh, with some people there. So what we're looking at here are uh, sort of standard um, global timing measures 
called the pairwise variability indices. And these days, it's, it's not so much used to try and work out what kind of rhythm a language has, whether it's stress-timed or syllable-timed or moro-timed, but is there variation? Is there timing variation in general? And it's normalised, so this is to try and sort of uh, remove uh, too much uh, speaker-specific tempo variation. So we've got our usual suspects here that are, you know, as Rachel was saying, the same applies to phonetics and speech science uh, and prosody. You know, we used to have very, very, you know, English, Japanese, French were, you know, very, very much the most widely studied languages for a long time. But now, of course, because of uh, the wonderful um, access to, to data and people have got much more typological interest in exploring different kinds of languages. So that's, that's been a huge improvement. So here we have uh, English at one end and the height of the bar indicates the most variable when you're looking at vowel, consonant, vowel in intervals or vowel, consonant, consonant, vowel intervals. It's looking at what's the variation between one vowel and the next across that particular interval. So English is there because, of course, the complex syllable structure, um, strong stress system, strong vowel weakening, shortening, and unstressed syllables, and so on. But we also see um, the northern Marquis variety holding its own there because it is, again, I think this is fact that we have long vowels, we have diphthongs alternating a lot with short vowels, so we do end up getting quite a nice pattern there. Then comes Tahitian, Rurdu, Maupiti, uh, and then finally, the Eo Enata, which has been the language where there's been the most debate over are there long vowels or not? And in fact, I think it seems to be the case that we are getting quite a big distinction there between the two varieties. So I suspect um, the uh, vowel length argument is still probably going to go on, but it does seem to be the case that these are very, these differences between the two uh, varieties of my piece and are very much emerging when we look at the synchronic data. And by the way, the synchronic data is based on uh, readings of the north or the south wind and the sun, our favourite old chestnut text in phonetics for the I'm pleased he did play it a few times for you because it does appear to be also something very special that the uh, Northern Marquis and uh, speakers talk about and, and this sort of, they actually have a name for it, a phonetic name for it, vowel lengthening and it's a strong process of penultimate vowel lengthening that they do in a particular kinds of performative tasks and of course one can argue that the kind of task that the speakers were doing here was highly performative in that they were they really did sort of get into a kind of, uh, you know, a very particular kind of uh, 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 register uh, when they were producing these data. But we do see some variation, but I was quite surprised that there was this sort of high end clustering, but then when you think about the alternations of long and short vowels and diphthongs and the distributions in these languages, that probably uh, isn't so surprising after all. We have no vowel reduction or undershoot but uh, in, um, in some cases, though, we, we did see some vowel addition and syllable addition. Okay, the third one uh, and is, is the most recent work, and thinking about glottal stops, because as you probably heard, there are other lot of them, and it's an incredibly important consonant phoneme in French Polynesian languages. And um, typically, we think of phonetically the uh, glottal stop as a period of full glottal closure, um, complete closure of the vocal folds, but, but often it's also uh, a period of complete closure and then some sort of uh, global pulsing as well. Uh, so in fact, there isn't just one kind of production of a global stop. Okay, so it seems to be quite a varied and quite a complex sound in this way. Uh, it's constricted and probably a little bit might like my voice at the moment. Um, so it can actually be realised as creaky phonation up to full occlusion. And in fact, some great work by Mark Garrelick um, 
uh, talks about this sort of reprising, uh, this kind of continuum from Landford and Madison that we, we see that in fact there's this glottal continuum from the glottal fricative at one end to the glottal stop, stopping off with breathy vowels and creaky vowels in the middle thing. Also, I think, uh, and in prosody union again, uh, there's a really strong prosodic role for our globalization as well, particularly in vowel initial position. So, uh, the only thing I want you to, to look at here are the instances of what looks like an apostrophe, because that's the kind of incidence of uh, global stops. Now, this isn't a historical phonology talk, but in many of you, if, if you recall way back when you did first year linguistics, you probably had the old Eastern Polynesian um, set, but here we have the um, uh, cases of the, the three languages I'm talking about here, the northern Maikis and variety of Kahiva, Tahitian and Urutu. Now, Urutu is a, is a wonderful language. It's the Austral language spoken in the far south, where we have huge amounts of, of gestural loss. Okay, the term I prefer rather than phonetic erosion, so gestural loss. Um, so, uh, quite an interesting kind of differences between them. So, in Tahitian, the glottal stop uh, has been reconstructed. Uh, from velas, so velas are, are missing here, although we do get loan words. Urumutu, uh, the Austral uh, language spoken in the south, glottal stop corresponds to not just the velas, but labiodentals and the glottal fricative, but um, also um, uh, Walworth, Mary Walworth says that there are loan words with labiodental fricatives due to the influence of ta Tahitian, because there is, of course, been lots and lots of contact. As Bruce Biggs, the late Bruce Biggs said, you know, these people were seafaring people. There was a lot of movement between the islands, so lots of contact. Interestingly, my Hearson, no liquid. Okay. So, here we have... Um, Mohana. Mohana. So we're comparing Runtu, okay, which has lost its glottal fricative, but Tahitian still has it. So we see, I uh, think, a rather nice example of a glottal stop, indicated just by a Q here. So hopefully you can see the glottal pulsations that are showing up quite clearly, I think, in the speech waveform that's been superimposed on the spectrogram, uh, as opposed to the kind of more fricative like uh, energy that we see in the uh, fricative version. So that's a fairly straightforward the, the comparison of the two. Now if we turn our attention to uh, Marquesan and here the northern variety, uh, according to uh, Margaret Mutu and Tekituo for the Wapu dialect, which is very closely related to the Nukahiva speakers that I worked with, we still have full glottal stop, and I think you can see it again very clearly in the left uh, left panel, if you look where I've marked the red glottal stop symbol, so very, very stop-like, okay, very, very stop-like. But then when we move to another example where we are essentially moving away from the word edge, moving away from stress, we start to see uh, another variant emerge, i.e. creaky voice, essentially. Uh, and so that's what I've tried to indicate also in the uh, panels. So, moving on now, though, to a quantitative investigation that I was able to do. Just, so those were just some sort of illustra illustrations from our um, a North Wind and the Sun Corpus. I just want to talk a little bit about a special experiment we did where we examined stops in Tahitian. So we recorded six speakers using the Laringa graph, uh, recorded Papete, uh, and just a few indicators here. I'm sorry, the red signal is not, not easy to spot there. But essentially, where you see the arrows, that's trying to indicate interesting stuff that's going emerging in the global signal itself. So the global signal has been derived and sort of flipped on its head to sort of show uh, instances of full global contact. Now, the thing that, that surprised me, and this was a genuine discovery, is that we saw very similar global patterns also for the stops that had oral gestures. So in other words, what we were seeing were globally reinforced stops all the way through, which means that, of course, when you talk about gestural loss and phonetic erosion, where things end up as global stops, essentially, what used to be there was globally reinforced anyway, and it seems that it is emerging in the yeah, symphonic that we Sorry, Sabrina. So, uh, here we have some violin plots, and so what we're looking at uh, 
Essentially, Q here is just our easy transcription for the global stop. And uh, just looking at voicing fraction, that is degree of, of voicing, that we, we see, yes, you know, if we compare initials versus medials, because this is where we're meant to get lenition, okay, in medial word, medial context. This is where we're, with, in, in many other languages, people say you should be just getting creepy vowels. But no, we actually get quite a bit of clustering down the bottom end of the scale there, so the global stops to a certain extent are packing very similarly to the other stops, uh, and similar kind of pattern when we just look at um, uh, initials uh, and medials, although we do see more variation definitely in the medials, and a little bit of variation depending on level and degree of accent. Just the last plot now, strength of global excitation, probably something you're already all feeling at the moment. Anyway, so this is a, a, a new, newish measure that people have started to, to look at, and it just takes a finer grained look at the, at the uh, actual laryngeal pulses. And we see very much if, that the global stops that are shown just on the left are very much travelling with uh, the, uh, uh, you know, there's very little variation, it seems, emerging depending on accentuation. And they clustering to a certain extent with the voiceless stops, although we are getting a little bit of, of extra voicing that's uh, getting in there. But I didn't expect that either. I expected to see that green line a bit more variable, essentially. Okay, so uh, in summary, yes, we are seeing a lot. Of, we are seeing variation, but we don't see nearly the same kind of de degree of um, uh, creaky vowels being dominant variants that people like Gorelick found in his survey of 261 languages from across the world. So thinking about those violin plots that we were just looking at, his were really swarmed very much towards the voicing end of the scale, that is towards the, the top of the scale. I think we've got stoppy old stops going on here, that, that well-known phonetic term, um, even in conditions where we might expect reduction. If there is weakening, it tends to be away from the edges of word, words, away from accented syllable onsets. Uh, what we didn't see, because this was a very lab fond type controlled experiment, when we look though at our less constrained corpora, we do see in certain function words much more evidence of this, so stay tuned, that'll be the next thing that we look at. Uh, also, variation across generations and languages, so in the Marquesan we see uh, many more um, proportion of creaky vowels and they say we will do or I think there is really that kind of need to preserve contrast. Uh, what about the liquids in Marquesan or the liquid, sorry I had corrected that typo but it's still there, so there only a single liquid. Uh, short and momentary voiced articulations and perhaps this is where we're going to see many more of those uh, lamited um, uh, creaky vowel type realizations, but that is something that remains to be seen. So, our last talk today, and questions again, we'll have to wait till after the session, um, is Felicity Lincoln. Selection doesn't always favor the simple evolution of Gurindji Creole. And Felicity's co author, Lyndall Bronner, is not here today. Oh, yes, there she is. Do you want to come back? No, no, she doesn't. Um, so I think that I'm the only thing standing between you and a drink at the moment. <laughs> um, so this is uh, a collaboration which is, um, again, like Rachel was sort of saying before, a real curdle baby and um, maybe just to mix metaphors a bit, I think we'd safely say that Simon Greenhill was our cherub that throughout the arrows of love um, and um, we found this uh, collaboration between linguistics and biology and mathematics to be um, a really fruitful, fantastic um, and fun one. So um, I'd like to acknowledge Lyndall Bromham um, who's here, who's an um, evolutionary biologist, Shava, who's a mathematician also here at um, ANU, I don't think is around though, no. And uh, Cassandra Algy, who's um, a Gurindji collaborator, who definitely isn't here because she was just texting me. Um, 
that this is a sort of project that can't be done without um, all of these people and all of this uh, expertise. So um, we're interested in this talk in uh, language, uh, language content and morphological complexity. Um, so there's been numerous studies that have shown instances of the reduction of morphological complexity in situations of language contact. Uh, most of these studies have been based on uh, single variants which have been shown to undergo simplification. In this particular study, what we wanted to do was use multiple variants um, chosen just for their fact of variation to avoid the circular issue of, um, this, of the, sorry, the issue of circular argumentation. So, uh, for instance, you know, picking variables that are known to be undergoing simplification and then making claims that language contact equals simplification. Um, and for those of you who aren't aware, this issue of morphological complexity and language contact is um, a really big issue. There have actually been punch-ups at Creolist uh, conferences before uh, because of it. Um, and if you're interested in that, uh, a little bit more of the reasons for that, I wrote a, a slightly tetchy column for the Journal of Pigeon and Creole Languages um, earlier this year, which sort of outlines um, a lot of the history around this particular issue. Um, but what we're doing in this paper um, is using uh, uh, biological methods um, to try and overcome this issue of using single variants and the kind of circular argumentation that can come with that. So um, we're uh, working with the Gurindji community to model language change over a number of generations by adapting classic Wright Fisher um, evolutionary models. So we're interested in um, evaluating whether the adoption of elements from uh, Gurindji and Creole, which is the English-based Creole language which has come into contact um, in, uh, with Gurindji people since colonisation, whether this is random, um, whether it's biased towards one of the parent languages, either Gurindji or Creole, um, or it's actually driven by simplification. Um, and these models actually have been applied to simulated data sets before, um, but this is almost um, the first application of the right official population model to real language data. Um, we didn't quite um, be, uh, we weren't quite the first people. Um, there was a, a paper that came out that was about English, not very interesting. Also, 16 <laughs> variables, also not very interesting. Um, we see the data set that we um, uh, have been working with. Um, oops, wrong button. Um, so, um, this is um, an, uh, an image uh, of um, a, a family um, at Kalkarinji, the Karinji community. Uh, Topsy Dodd, the, the eldest um, person in that photo, is someone I've worked a lot with. She's a very senior songswoman um, in the community. And this is her daughter, Deborah, and then her uh, maternal granddaughter, um, Vikara. So, um, Topsy's um, a, a, a kind of classic member of her generation where she's a bilingual speaker of Gurindji and Creole and she classically code switches between these languages. Um, Deborah, her daughter, is the first generation of Gurindji Creole speakers who have transformed those code switching practices into a new autonomous language system, uh, which the community refers to as Gurindji Creole now. Um, but there's a lot of variable use within that language. Her daughter, um, Fikara, the little one there, who is now speaking, wasn't at the time, um, also speaks Gurindji Creole. She's the second generation, but there's far less variable use um, in her uh, language. The nice thing about um, this kind of work is that um, within this um, intergenerational snapshot, we can see language change actually um, unfolding as it happens. So this is one of the nice marriages between uh, linguistics and biology is that often we can um, provide um, data, I guess, um, in, in ways that um, you can actually see evolution actually happening before your eyes. Okay. Um, so, Gurindji Creole itself um, is characterised by the adoption of some Gurindji features, some Creole features which unfortunately have come up just as a different shade of green <laughs> to confuse with the Gurindji uh, uh, features on this particular um, version. Um, and there's been the development of innovative elements. Some of the Creole features too have since acrolectralized um, um, because of continued contact with English um, and also variation is really um, a characteristic of Gurindji Creole. So here's an example sentence the big dog slept next to the table. You can see um, Creole elements, some of those are lexical like bigger job, uh, which comes from biggest but just means big. Um, it, it has a um, uh, Creole adjectival marker 1, which clearly comes from English 1. 
the preposition one side, which means next to, clearly comes from um, English's form and table, is quite obvious. There's Gurindji elements as well um, uh, in the lexicon, so you can see waddle for dog, muggin for sleep, which is a verb that's originally come from a co-verb. And you can also see grammatical elements from both languages, the past tense mark of bin, which originally comes from being, um, and the Gurindji uh, case marker there, uh, the locative case marker. So that's, you know, um, so one person who might be expressing that sentence in Gurindji Creole. You also get um, different kinds of variations. So, um, for instance, um, sometimes uh, the, the more acrylicized version of a bigger J is just big that might be used, and one side might be replaced to by next to. And then you get also innovative um, features. So you can see the double marking there of that um, uh, static location with uh, Lama David instead of just the, um, the Gurindji case marker. Okay, so um, in order to create, uh, do the kind of work we want to do, which is to analyse multiple um, variables across different generations, we need different kinds of data. So we need comparable multiple variables across multiple speakers from different generations. Um, within the variation of sociolinguistics literature, conversational data um, is the gold standard. And indeed, for this work, conversational data and free um, narration did provide the data basis for deciding what kind of variables um, we were going to target. But they're not comparable enough to build um, a data set for analysis, this kind of um, uh, style of speech. Uh, topics are often free ranging, um, and you can't guarantee that particular words or grammatical um, features are going to be used. Uh, you might be able to do this if you're um, just focusing on uh, phonetic variables because they're much more um, frequent. So instead we uh, supplemented the conversation and free narrative data um, using semi-formal recitation methods, so classic direct to match your task, which many of you know from semantic typology, uh, picture prompt narratives, the classic kind of frog stories, but also a beautiful set of um, picture stories created by Carmen Shaughnessy that many of us have used um, in Central Australia. And the idea of these is that they ensure that speakers have an opportunity to express particular words um, or morphosyntactic features using the variant of their choice. Um, and also, um, they have multiple chances to um, use those uh, variants so we can get frequency-based data. So the corpus um, for uh, this, uh, this work that we've been doing, this is um, just a single paper that came out in language, but they've been uh, different kinds of papers uh, that, from the, the work we've been doing together. Um, it's a 165-hour um, corpus. It's transcribed, translated, anonymized, and um, annotated. Um, this is a, a, a very large corpus um, for an Australian language. This is now deposited in Paradisac, and the, the work couldn't have been done without the um, summer research students who came through the summer research program, uh, some, uh, some of whom we were talking about yesterday. Um, the corpus was also massively cleaned up by Sasha um, Vilmont, which made it um, really, really searchable. So that was fantastic too, thanks. So there's 165 hours, nearly 160 speakers, over 400,000 words, um, and many, many more morphemes if you can count morphemes. The data set for analysis is distilled from um, this corpus, so there's just over 20,000 data points across three generations of Gurindji people, so this is about 78 people. Um, the larger data set that, that we've used for other studies has had 174 variables, um, 346 variants. Um, for this particular study, we just use 120 um, of those variables. Okay, so, um, you know, what are these variables? This is an example of um, static location. Um, so we're back to our dog uh, sleeping next to the table. Um, so, within the Gurindji community, um, there's different ways of expressing this. Some people might use um, uh, a Gurindji case marker um, attached to uh, a table. Some people might use a Creole um, preposition. And other people might use a more innovative double mark strategy where you're using both the Creole preposition and the Gurindji case marker simultaneously. And you get different kinds of patterns um, within the community. Some, so, some people only use the Gurindji case marker. Some people only use the Creole preposition. 
Um, some people with pattern 3 will sometimes use the, uh, the Greenwich and case marker, other times use the Creole preposition, and then other people will just use the Creole preposition um, or use double marking. What's interesting is those are the four patterns you see across the 78 people that we've looked at. You don't actually get, for instance, people using all, um, all three of those uh, strategies. So um, we've then looked um, across 120 uh, variables to do this. Um, and in order to do this, we're using uh, right Fisher models, which are a way of looking at the selection of um, variants across uh, different generations. So, um, yeah. Okay, so there have been, as I said before, th several theoretical studies that have looked at the um, mathematical link between right Fisher models and models of um, language evolution. So um, some of these uh, look at the way that a speaker say copies a variant used by another random speaker in a previous time step. Um, in this sort of case, uh, language change looks very similar to language transmission. Um, you can also think of Wright Fisher models as describing a person's learning where a person updates um, their usage frequency after a variant that they've heard from other speakers using that particular um, language feature. So it, um, the right Fisher models can map quite nicely um, onto language evolution. We're back to um, the question of uh, uh, complexity. So how was this managed? Um, so each uh, linguistic variant was coded according to um, a three level of uh, morphological complexity, so high, medium, low, um, which is somewhat reductive, but remember we're doing this across multiple variables, so we're looking at the patterns. Um, what we did was look specifically at absolute complexity, so um, there's, a, there's a big literature on this. Um, so this is the number of elements contained in each subsection of grammar and the number of distinctions that each of these elements makes. Um, so for instance, monomorphemic content words that essentially have no morphological structure, a low in morphological complexity as are function words like prepositions, um, content words that have more morphological structure and medium complexity as are derivational morphology and inherent inflection because these are pieces of morphology that um, only look within the, the kind of immediate mode like a noun phrase for instance or a prepositional phrase. And then um, elements like contextual inf inflection so um, agreement in the case um, is high complexity because it has to look across the entire clause um, to uh, uh, come up with the, the correct form. So within the, um, our uh, database, then we, co we coded each of the um, variants for complexity. So for instance, Gurindji case, uh, uh, because it's derivational morphology, it's locative um, case marking is coded medium. The Creole preposition is uh, monomorphemic uh, function word, so it's low complexity. And then the um, innovative double marking is um, also medium complexity, because again, it's only concerned with that. Um, immediate uh, sort of syntactic mode. Um, and then we did this across the 120 uh, variables and their variants. So what did we find? Well, um, I'm going to um, unravel uh, a beautiful um, plot uh, that uh, Jar produced and Lindell has since crocheted, <laughs> which is rather nice. So it's, it's a bit complex, but I just want you to focus on a couple of things. So um, it's going to appear generation by generation. The first generation is the um, uh, grandparent generation, Topsy Dodds generation. The next one are the adult generation, and generation three is the, the child generation. Um, the orange is uh, Gurindji, the, the um, blue is uh, Creole, that top band there are the lexical variants, the bottom band are the morphosyntactic variants. So the first thing we do find is there is indeed a bias towards Creole, um, which we uh, knew to be the case. Um, so you can see from generation one going to the adult generation, going to the child generation, you can see the amount of orange disappearing. Um, oops, I have to press the right buttons. Um, to the extent that you can see that some of those variants have gone to fixation is the ones with little K or uh, the G underneath. Okay, so. Um, no, um, uh, uh, so there's a bias towards Creole, but the really interesting finding um, is that there's um, uh, no bias towards simpler variants. 
So the complex Creole variants are frequently adopted rather than their simple Gurindji alternatives. Simple Creole variants are also no more likely to be adopted into the contact language than the complex uh, Creole variants. And complex Gurindji variants also have a greater rate of adoption than most simple and highly um, complex Gurindji um, variants. So um, I guess on the sort of levels of discovery, this is something that um, was uh, perhaps um, unexpected, perhaps unexpected given the, the literature on morphological complexity. So just to conclude so that everyone can go um, and have a drink. Um, we know that um, variation is a crucial driver of language change. So in order to understand evolution, we need to be able to model um, linguistic variation in ways um, where we can see patterns emerging. And we need to be able to do this across multiple variants so that we can really understand um, how not just single variants within languages are changing, but actually the, the way that the whole language system is changing. So linguistics has actually had um, quite a long partnership um, with biology in adopting um, biological methods. Um, we, there's been uh, lots of work done uh, using phylogenetic methods, for instance, with historical linguistics um, uh, before we've been looking to use population um, genetics uh, models. Um, but um, this, this has been one of the first applications of um, right Fisher evolution models to linguistic data. Um, it has required absolutely scaling up um, the kind of data that we use and using, using multiple variables in their expression um, because we want to look at variants um, in the, the, one of these multiple variants in order to map change across an entire language. But in doing so, um, I think what we've done is been able to avoid some of the pitfalls of theorising on language change based on individual variables. And one of the classics of this, I think, has been that um, simplification occurs through language contact because this is indeed not the case with Gurindji Creole. Thanks.